Gwyn Leopard Entertainment presents Rubber is a movie about a killer piece of rubber. No, not that type of rubber, though I'm not surprised that that movie exists. With a tire, yes. Here we have a slasher movie where the tire does the slashing, a premise which may sound revolutionary to some and tiresome to others. Okay, I will stop with the puns now. When someone tells you that there is a movie about a tire that kills people, you probably will form some expectations on what a movie would look like pretty quickly. While Rubber is probably the only movie to have this specific premise, it does have the general premise of dozens of B-movies in which something ordinary is transformed into something extraordinary. And starts killing people. It's the same type of film as Night of the Lepus, Them, Godzilla, and modern B-movies that extract humor from the premise such as T and Killer Condom movie and the Sharknado movies. When you first heard about Sharknado, you probably had a good idea of what the movie was going to be like without having to watch it. Patton Oswald covered this in his bit on Deathbed, The Bed That Eats. It just now got put out on DVD this year and it's called Deathbed the bed that eats people. I'm not making, go IMDB this, this is a real movie. Deathbed, the bed that eats people. And it's about a bed that's evil and it eats people. That's the whole movie. And the backstory is, is like the 1500s, there's a demon, the guy kills the demon with the sword, the demon's blood gets on the bed, now the bed's possessed, go to present day, 77, when people fuck on the bed, the bed kills them, cause it's evil. That's the, that's the fucking plot. This guy wrote Deathbed, the bed that eats people, took it to a second guy and said, okay, it's called Deathbed, the bed that eats people. Now the backstory is, there's a demon, and then the second guy said, stop drilling, you hit oil. You had me at Deathbed. We are going to rent cameras, buy film stock, hire a crew, we are shooting this masterpiece. They hired a crew. Caterers woke up at dawn and boiled coffee and sliced bagels for people to have the fuel to act in deathbed, the bed that eats people. So look for my new movie next summer. Uh, it's called Rape Stove. The stove that rapes people. I'm very excited. The thing is that Patton Oswald couldn't be further from the truth. Yes, there is a bed that eats people in the movie, but the execution of the premise is so bizarre that the film goes against all of the expectations you would have from reading the title, despite how descriptive it is. Same goes for Rubber. Yes, it is about a tire that kills people, but it's not the fun, sleazy, low-budget B-horror movie you would expect. It works less as a horror comedy than it does as an absurdist meta-comedy. It's an utterly divisive movie, so let's talk about it. When talking about a movie, I always like to talk about the people behind them. In this case, the mastermind behind Rubber is the film's writer and director, Quentin Dupuis. Probably not pronouncing that right, but whatever. While he did make some films before Rubber, Rubber was his breakout film, and it is his first film with a decent budget. Prior to filmmaking, the Plutes made electronic music under the name of Mr. Oizel, and as such, he does the score for most of his films. After seeing all three of his films following Rubber, I can say with certainty that he definitely knows what he's doing and has developed a distinct style and mode of storytelling. When looking at his career in retrospect, it becomes obvious that everything about Rubber was carefully crafted, even though it might not seem that way on a first viewing. Rubber actually isn't my favorite film of him. If I were to rank his films, I would say that his later venture, Reality, is his best, followed closing by Wrong and Rubber, with Wrong being his worst. The reason why I am talking about Rubber right now and not Wrong or Reality is because I feel it is his most misunderstood film. Rubber is about as meta as it gets. If you aren't familiar with the term, meta is often used to describe the creative work that is self-referential. In film, this could manifest itself as breaking of the fourth wall, in which characters acknowledge the audience, and may even change the course of events due to this acknowledgement, like in funny games. The screen franchise is also meta by calling attention to genre conventions. Any film about the making of a film is also inherently meta as it calls attention to the filmmaking process. In a very original manner, Rubber does all of these things and more. Let's start with the fourth wall breaking, which turns out to not be a fourth wall breaking at all. In the Steven Spielberg movie, E.T., why is the alien brown? No reason. In Love Story, why do the two characters fall madly in love with each other? No reason. In Oliver Stone's JFK, 
Why is the president suddenly assassinated by some stranger? No reason. In the excellent Chainsaw Massacre by Toby Hooper, why don't we ever see the characters go to the bathroom or wash their hands like people do in real life? Absolutely no reason. Worse, in The Pianist by Polanski, how come this guy has to hide and live like a bum when he plays the piano so well? Once again, the answer is no reason. I could go on for hours with more examples. The list is endless. You probably never gave it a thought, but all great films, without exception, contain an important element of no reason. And you know why? Because life itself is filled with no reason. Why can't we see the air all around us? No reason. Why are we always thinking? No reason. Why do some people love sausages and other people hate sausages? No fucking reason. Come on, don't waste your time explaining that garbage. Let's go. Just a minute, let me finish. Ladies, gentlemen, the film you are about to see today is an homage to the no reason, that most powerful element of style. Okay, everybody turn around. Good, enjoy. Excuse me, is it going to be in color or in black and white? Ignoring the contents of the speech for now, let's talk about how this scene is set up. We first think that this person is breaking the fourth wall and talking to us, the audience. But then it is revealed that he is actually talking to a crowd of people, an in-movie audience ready to watch a real-life movie. This is the only movie that I know of that has an on-screen audience. This also sets up the expectation that everything that is about to happen is not actually happening but done for the benefit of this on-screen audience. Of course, as the film goes on, it gets a little more complicated than that. But before we talk about that, let's talk about this opening speech from the police officer who actually appears to be the director and an actor of the movie within the movie. This is one moment in the movie that might piss lots of people off. Even though it is not delivered by the real director to the real audience, many still interpret the speech as the thesis statement for Rubber. A movie we made with the sole intention of being illogical that likes to rub how illogical it is in the audience's face in a very pretentious way. I think, however, it is important to separate the character who delivers his speech from the real director. It's easy to assume that the Pukes didn't give a shit about his audience, that he just wanted to make a movie with a premise that will suck people in and then defend the movie by saying that all movies are illogical. Indeed, I would agree with this interpretation if one was talking about the motives of this in-movie director. This police officer character obviously does not give a shit about the on-screen audience and wants them to suffer. In fact, as the so-called movie within the movie stretches into days, audience is starving and is fed poisoned food by the director's right-hand man. That doesn't mean Quentin wants us to suffer when watching the film, even though some viewers may feel that way. It's also important to consider how ridiculous the examples of no reason given are. There are definitely reasons for not showing characters go to the bathroom in a film, especially in a film such as the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Birdemics and the scenes of driving may be realistic in how they show characters get from point A to point B, but no one in their right mind would consider them necessary. Despite appearing to talk directly to us in the uniform of an authority figure, this character is clearly full of shit and we shouldn't really trust anything he says. While there's no reason for a tire to suddenly become sentient and kill people, everything that happens in Rubber most certainly has a reason, even if those reasons are ambiguous and probably only known to Clinton the Duke. It baffles me that people consider Rubber to be a bad movie when it contains an Oscar worthy performance from an inanimate object. The rather dry, cold, and often emotionless acting from the human cast greatly contrasts the wide range of emotions that the special effects team gives our, to our set the entire. It really is a marvel to watch a get up and wobble across the desert. The pacing of these early scenes is very slow, and indeed, on a second watch, I could definitely feel the passing of time. It could be argued that the pukes want you to be bored. 
A motivation which many would find pretentious, including myself, if the entire movie was like this. It's already boring. Don't be so negative. It's just the beginning. It's gonna pick up. Just be patient. But thankfully, he makes up for it later on in the movie. Once the tire comes into contact with human beings and starts to go rogue. While the opening speech suggests that everything that happens in the film is planned, it appears that the tire was not privy to these plans and starts to go off strip in a rampage where he becomes infatuated with a human woman. It's extremely satisfying to see the pretentious in-movie director have his sadistic project fall apart around him. More evidence that the opening speech is not intended to be the message of the juke. As the film progresses, we begin to root for the murderous tire against all odds. After going to great lengths to set up the idea of an on-screen audience, one would think that they would be used more often to give commentary to the on-screen events. Pukes, however, twist these expectations by having them die off halfway through the film, when an odd character who appears to be the director's assistant poisons them. The only problem is that one audience member is so invested in the chronicles of our tire that he does not take the poison. Indeed, it is revealed that the only reason why the director is forced to continue the story after the tire goes off script is because he still has an audience watching. Otherwise, they would have packed it up and called it a day. This audience member even offers up some suggestions on how the movie should end. Excuse me, uh, I hate to bother you, but... but uh, the way I look at it, this scene makes no sense at all. And not that it was great to begin with, but at least I understood it. Now it's just, uh, totally confusing. That's why I took the trouble to come on this way. The bazooka, even better. No, no, listen, listen. Even better, you get you get one of you guys with a with a flamethrower, huh? Just huh? You gotta do something. I mean, do something, anything. No, no. The idea was for him to blow up the dummy himself and set off a dynamite. That way, he'll pop himself off himself, so to speak. Well, that's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. What I'm asking is speed up the action. That's all. You know, boom, boom, huh? Yeah, but then we wouldn't be here if you'd eaten a damn turkey. The rebellious nature of this character and his determination to get his money's worth and watch the film to its completion makes him one of the most likable human characters in the film. By having the rest of the audience get bored and die, the Pukes is acknowledging that this film is not for everyone, but rather for the select few. Once again, this can be interpreted as being extremely pretentious. But once again, I think we should contrast this with the on-screen director who rather hoped that his movie was for no one and that all of his audience would die. The Pukes, on the other hand, acknowledges that there will be a lot of people who don't like his work, but also that there will be at least some who do, and that he is making this movie for them. Having a niche audience isn't inherently pretentious. Thinking that that niche audience is better than the mainstream audience would be pretentious, but I don't think that's what the Pukes is saying here. In the course of writing the script for this review, I realized how much more I appreciate this movie. I would really like to acknowledge the fact that at surface level, this really is some fun, funny movie with a bunch of exploding heads, and it could be enjoyed as such as long as you tune into the movie's absurd sense of humor. That being said, there definitely is more to it than meets the eye at the first glance, and I hope that this review was successful in diving beneath the surface and providing a different perspective. As always, thank you for watching. If you liked the video and want to see more, Please like and subscribe. Don't forget to embrace the weirdness. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye. You're nothing but a rubber shit.